okay. It's hard for me to tell. I have my hearing aid turned up, which means I speak softly. But tell me if you can't hear me. Usually then I sometimes turn them down so that I speak loud, but then I have to turn them back up again so I can hear you. So you'll have to tell me if you can't hear me. Um, right. As was said, I've, I've been in various places, but at the moment I'm here. I'm also still, I work here two days a week. I get paid here two days a week. Let's make it accurate. I'm here most of the time. Also, <laughs> part of a small consulting partnership with some of my friends, Jane Waterhouse, Joe Johnson, um, and also still have an attachment over here, I guess, to where I was until two months ago. Um, I guess this talk is to introduce me, in a sense, to the centre a bit more what I do and what I'm going to say now, and we know this coming out shortly, I'm really interested in water quality. Um, there hasn't that met not that many people in that area in the Centre of Excellence in the past. There was Amelia Wigner, she's not here now. And of course there's the catchment based people. Um, Bob Pressy, Paul Hay and so on who I work with. But in the marine effects of water quality it's not a really strong part, but anyway, I'm here now, that's what I'm here for. All right, so I want to work with anybody who's interested in the marine effects, terrestrial runoff, sediment, plastics, um, nutrients, pesticides, sediment, whatever you can think of, pharmaceuticals, um, industrial chemicals, metals, doesn't matter. <laughs> I mean, it's all of that. It's one time or another. I'm also interested in international coral reefs as well, not just to let that around. Um, now, I'm going to, this is sort of a non coherent talk a little bit because it's stuff we're doing right now. It's a summary of a whole lot of stuff that I'm doing right now, and it'll give you a flavour of the sort of stuff we're doing. And I'm going to introduce it through scientific consensus statement that was mentioned that I've been involved in. There's been four scientific consensus statements about water quality in the Great Barrier Reef carried out. I've been involved in all four from back in 2001, but I've been led the last three and the one that's going on right now, um, particularly with Jane Waterhouse, um, my colleague who we do these. As part of those, and that latest one will be finished in theoretically February next year, maybe. As part of them, we also carry out what we call risk assessments, risk assessments of water quality and the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and we do those for the purpose of the consensus statement, they form a part of it, but we also do them for catchment management prioritisation. If we're going to manage water quality up the catchment, where, to, where do we do it? Up in the Normandy catchment or there on the Mary catchment at the other end? In what industry, grazing, bananas, sugar, urban, mining, whatever, and in which parts of the catchment do we get the best effect? And to know where we want to manage which rivers, we need to link the offshore effects back to particular rivers. That's what I'll sort of be talking about a bit today. Um, there's been lots of these consensus statements. This is just an example. Um, and there's been lots of these risk assessments. You can fill up papers with some of the publishers' reports, some of the papers as well. Um, and we're into the middle of another one right now. I'm working with Jane Waterhouse doing that again. Unfortunately, fortunately for her, she just flew to India, so I'm left trying to do it myself. But anyway, um, so let's talk about risk. What's risk? Well, risk is. Simple in principle, I'm talking about technical, proper risk. To the term, it's hazard that something happened times the consequence, the size of the consequence, the seriousness of the effect. Now, I'm going to talk about hazard being exposure to poor water quality, where's there out, where out on the reef is there poor water quality, and the consequence side of it is how serious is the effect of that poor water multiply those together, you get a formal measure of risk. And to do that, we need exposure. Where's the poor water quality offshore? And we need to know what the effects of the poor water quality and how serious they are. And here's 
business sort of maps we draw of risk showing sort of um, different sorts of um, crack sediment or something. I don't know what this one is in the middle, something wrong. Added up water quality offshore. And you can see there's mostly inshore, not much up here, and so on. Other ones. Now, exposure, um, we need to know the stuff that's coming out of the rivers, where does it go? How far does it go? What concentrations does it achieve offshore? And we do that through using remote sensing, sampling offshore, particularly in high river discharge events. That's when it all happens. The rivers flow, as once again they will in next month, January. Uh, all the GBR rivers hopefully will have some big discharge events over the wet season. And we go out and sample them, we've been doing that forever. And we use remote sensing where that's usable sometimes. And we uh, are able to model exposure. This is paper from Jorge, who's of course in the centre now. And we're able to look at the exposure of dissolved inorganic nitrogen, just in semi quantitative terms here, very high to very low. And this one's sediment. Total suspended sediment. These are just flavors of the sort of things we do, and we've done that by using plume, plume mapping from space, from sampling, even from aeroplanes flying over it, where it is. Um, so we can assess exposure to different sorts of poor water quality from sediment in the water, nutrients in the water. The effects of nutrients, if you like, phytoplankton in the water, because that's what we can see from space sometimes, um, and pesticides in the water, we can assess the concentrations offshore by the methodology we use. So that's what I'm going to talk about, some of that work, but I'm going to go back to the beginning now, which is this introduction. Better talk a little bit about the Great Barrier Reef. I hope you all know about the Great Barrier Reef, but I'll do it anyway. You might know too much about so much. So the Great Barrier Reef is a bit up there. I need a better map. I've got a better one, but I didn't put it up. Great Barrier Reef doesn't just go to there. Of course, it goes to New Guinea, Torres Strait. A whole part of, big part of the Great Barrier Reef. I work up there as well because I'm interested in discharge from the Fly River into the Torres Strait and the effects of that discharge as well from the mines on the Fly River. This is really part of the Great Barrier Reef down here as well. A little bit here. I'll be Bay, lots of seagrass, a few reefs, and we well, used to be a few reefs, and dugongs and so on here. So my Great Barrier Reef goes from about there, up here, across to where the other little corner is here, up there, and up to about there, and across to there. Not that one, but it's there. The real ecological Great Barrier Reef, if you like. And it's um, deep. <coughs> lots of coral reefs, and seagrass, and other odds and ends. And the catchment, the, this part here, is also large, um, and it has a variety of land uses on it, sugar, beef, urban mining, and so on. Um, and we know about the discharge of and its effects through lots of work we've been doing about what happens when the stuff comes out. Um, the sediment, nitrogen, phosphorus, herbicides don't all come out equally along the whole length of the GBR. But these red arrows are meant to somehow show that right up north. Not much going on. There's not much agriculture, not many people, not much mining. So if you like delivery of pollutants, anthropogenic pollutants, from this area up here small, down here it's large, and right in the south, so all the way across here it's quite large. Very distinct division about here between high pollution into the Great Barrier Reef in an area where there's very little. Um, the amount of that material has increased greatly, one to five times, depending on the river. Some rivers haven't increased at all. Others five times as much sediment coming out, nitrogen, phosphorus, and of course herbicides. It's not, I don't put times there because there were no herbicides coming out when I was in the 200 years ago. So this is an absolute increase. 28 tonnes, probably a bit more than that, but just a few of them. And we remember pesticides are a nightmare. We can go to Grant Creek down towards there today, have a water sample. We, with the techniques we don't know, we might find 
30 to 40 separate pesticides. Not all herbicides or insecticides, fungicides, other things as too. So pesticides are a huge range of different things. But we do know about their loads through measurements and modelling about what comes out of the rivers and how much papers like this. <laughs> um, we have ways of, this is sort of a repeat of the Jorge's map as well. We know where they go through um, monitoring and taking samples and remote sensing for different things like suspended solids, dissolved in organic nitrogen pairs to herbicides. So we've been, for decades, we've been measuring where they go. I want to talk first a little bit about turbidity. And in, this is inshore areas, inshore reefs, inshore seagrass. Now, there's two sorts of turbidity, quite different. There's when flood plumes occur. So here we've got the Burdekin River. You can this is Townsville or somewhere. Burdekin River, big blob of mud coming out. Less mud here. Go right up the coast here. This is. You're then into an algal phytoplankton bloom. By then, the sediment's fallen out, but you've got the nutrients are growing phytoplankton and other bacteria in that as well. And here we've got the Herbert River here and here, two miles around Hitchinbrook, the Tully River, and so on. But you can see this is in the wet season, February, particular year, 2007, and you can see there turbidity there. You've seen from space in that case is due to the flood plume itself on that day. It's not coming out of the river. Over here, this is in October. There are no flood plumes in October. It normally doesn't rain. It's not impossible, but it's not normal to have any river flow in October. So what's all this stuff along here? Looks the same as that really, doesn't it? Well, it's not. That's resuspension. All the sediment that came out back in February is sitting there as flocculent material on the bottom of Cleveland Bay, there, West Cleveland Bay, there, and when the wind blows from the southeast at sufficient speed, it reaches things. Um, and you see the turbidity. So, this is a day when I'm sure there's relatively strong southeasterly winds, and that resuspends the bottom all along there. So, that's separate from the. This was the delivery event that delivered that stuff to be resuspended. But this is the long-term effect. And you can see if you're a seagrass sitting in here, right there, um, you might have been affected by this flood plume, but for the rest of the year, you're affected by the stuff that was delivered that is now being resuspended. Resuspense, it's got a distinct line here, out here, was that you get southeasterly winds, no matter how strong or we can only resuspend the bottom down to make up a number of you know, 12 metres maybe. Outside that, not strong enough, so out here, nothing happening. Too deep. Cyclones out here, another matter, they can respend the whole bottom, right down to 50 metres. But normal southeasterly winds, you get a turbid zone, and you will be out in, from Townsville in a boat, I assume, to the main route. It's beyond magnetic island, and what about clear? That's that boundary you can see there, there it is, right there. And you've just passed over 15 metres, that's all that's happened. And Inside there, resuspension. Outside there, no resuspension. Um, and we understand why we get this turbidity, and it's due to river discharges, sediment, more flocculent, easily resuspended material delivered to Cleveland Bay. The rest of that year, it gets resuspended, gets winnowed away then, and unless you get another delivery from the Burdekin, the water clears up. We've seen that very much in Cleveland Bay. Five to six years of, up until three years ago, big vertical discharges in Cleveland Bay, so turbid for long periods of time. I'll show some of this in a minute. Seagrass disappeared. Three years now, no vertical flows at all. No sediment delivery from the vertical for three years. Seagrass is back. <laughs> um, and you can see that here. Right. Um, I'll just, this is the discharge of water from the Burdekin in the years along the bottom, 2003 up to 13. You can see there were many years of small discharge, or even probably lower than this. Um, but by 2008, you have 
years, two years of big discharge, one year of not so big, another big discharge, and another big one here beyond 2013 as well. Um, and here's the clarity, photic depth, measured as photic depth from a satellite, um, from scale of weeks and algorithm. And you can see when the not much water coming, sediment coming out of the Burdekin River and new turns, water clarity, um, photic depth, 12 and a half metres. When there's lots of water, years when there's lots and lots of water coming out and sediment coming out of the Burdekin River, photic depth, two metres less, two metres. So if you're a seagrass at 11 metres out there, so when the Burdekin River is wide, photic depth's up here, then you disappear. Really. Fixed shell on the seagrass as well. So sediment is a um, coastal shallow than 12 metres because that's where the reef suspension. So that sediment turbidity effect is a coastal. So that's what I'm saying spatial, not offshore, coastal. It can be offshore but for different reasons. Algal blooms, well, despite people saying otherwise sometimes in the past. River plumes go right out into the Coral Sea in the area between here and, say, Cooktown, other places. No, you can see it here. This is the wet tropics. I don't know where this Hitchinbrook, so you can Hitchinbrook up to almost Cairns. Um, one day, day one of a flood plume coming out of a whole set of wet tropics rivers here. Day two, you're already out to the mid shelf. And day three, you're at right out in the coral sea, you've got an algal bloom, phytoplankton bloom, right out into the coral sea. This, so, in this particular area, where the reef's close to the coast, then you have rivers that put out new chance every year, the wet tropics rivers. Every year, the Tully River has a flow. Burdekin River, different business, other flow every year. These rivers flow every year, and you will have nutrient in. I won't say impacts, influences right across the shelf to the coral sea every year, every year, in that area, the wet tropics coast will call it. Um, so, once again, we're getting a spatial foil. That does not happen if you're in the Pompeys. The Pompeys are beyond, beyond any terrestrial river influence. I'll say that slightly hesitantly, maybe one day, but at the moment we'd say, this Pompey's too far off. Rivers don't influence out there. Um, there are some tricks going there because resuspension plumes get out there interesting. In shoulder bay, water gets resuspended all the time, shoulder bay, big tides. You see those plumes of sediment from resuspension. They, by the currents, they get taken out into the Pompey's, but I don't think they're doing anything. It's sort of natural anyway. Um, so now I'm going to talk about effects of nutrients, some of the effects, a whole set of effects that I'm involved in studying. First of all, the wonderful one of crown of thorns starfish. Um, you know our belief that nutrients from these rivers here again, that we saw in the last slide, uh, concentrate nutrients in this initiation area up here at certain times and due to certain climate and current things that encourages high survivorship of crown of thorns larvae in that area, and we get the initiation of a wave of outbreaks um, from this area here, the last one being in 2009 roughly, but remember there's been four waves now, 62 starting 78, 93, 2009. Roughly 16 year intervals. Another talk, we can talk about that. Um, so here we have um, an effect now of the nutrients, not just for water quality, but it's done something. It's done something. And uh, there's crown of thorns down here as well. But, um, I'll better go back to that. We think these crown of thorns, I'll talk about manta rays in a minute, but we think these crown of thorns down here are driven by natural oil and nutrients to do with Capricorn eddy current, uh, whereas these are associated with um, terrestrial nutrients. Um, it's interesting here the difference between exposure and effects. 
exposed area of poor, poor, poor water quality is here. However, the effects extend right down here because this is where the crown forms on the end of the top of the So the exposure area is different from the effect area. They're not the same. Um, bleaching. These are all subject to lots of current research, lots of controversy. We don't know how all these things work properly. This one's much worse than the crown of thorns, but this is Scott Waldridge and others work at uh, Wiedemann in Plymouth in the UK, Corelli, this is Corelli in the Caribbean and others, um, that suggest that if you have high nutrients, corals bleach at a low temperature threshold. Um, and this is Scott Waldridge's work suggests that where we have, even on the mid-shelf here, of this wet tropics area here, where we have high nutrients in discharge <laughs> periods, we've seen more bleaching than if there hadn't been high nutrients. Um, this is a very distinct temporal, only can occur at certain times. You have to have the high nutrients out there, that's the rivers have to be flying, that's okay, wet season, every wet season. However, you can only get bleaching when you have temperature rises as well. No matter how many nutrients are out there today, on the mid shelf of the Great Barrier Reef, I'm going to say roughly one bleach for well, so these combined effects. Um, I'll just say that in the far north up here, remember, where we had the bleaching, I don't know, on that scale somewhere here, we had bleaching <coughs> this year. It's pretty amusing. There is no terrestrial nutrient enrichment up there, I'll go to the same more. However, Scott Woodridge would say, and this is subject to some interesting stuff, there is some natural nutrient enrichment by upwelling, deep water upwelling, and that may affect a bit what happened up there, but that's all work in progress at the moment. Um, complicated slide, sorry, but what Scott can do in papers like this is look at what actually happens out here where you have high nutrients. There's those of belly. Increased numbers of zoven thalli due to nutrient enrichment. And the theory is, the very subject to lots of physiology yet to do, is that that upsets the animal symbiont relationship and they expel the zoven thalli more readily in that condition. Uh, Ames have got a project now looking at that in the sea symbiont at Ames starting next year. Lots of people interested in this. We can in the UK. Um, manta rays. Bring in everything. So manta rays. One, this is a wonderful story. Um, over here, which you can't see, sorry. <laughs> You'll see all these black dots here. This is um, Labiolian Island. Get over here too. You'll see all these black dots. Here's the, one of the flights. You need to fly into Labiolian Island. Um, back in 2000 and 13. The pilots flying into Lady Elliot, there's hundreds of manta rays there. And at a time when you don't, they come there in winter to feed, here's the middle of summer. Um, why? Well, with Scarlet Weeks and others, we looked at what's going on after the big floods in 2013 from the Mary and the Burnett River. In, on, some of you remember Bundaberg was under this much water in 2013. Um, huge, huge discharge from the Burnett, the big discharge from the Mary River into Harvey Bay. Here's, here's chlorophyll up here. Dark colours and more chlorophyll. The, 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 our site there is that circle, Lady Elliot on the southern end of the Great Barrier Reef. Lots of phytoplankton out there from the discharges from the rivers. And this is a chlorophyll anomaly map that I won't go into. Photic depth also really low out there, associated with the phytoplankton affecting the transparency of the water. And this is sea surface temperature down at the bottom here. These are anomalies over here, but I'm just going to look at this. Cool water. Where's the cool water coming from? It's coming from upwelling in that current, upwelling with more nutrients. Because remember, deep ocean, 400 metres down, huge amounts of nutrients in the ocean. It's only the surface that's got none, um, depleted. So here we've got a little, the Capricorn current goes around here. 
I think that way, you'll have to forgive me for that way, one way or the other, um, and brings up nutrients from the depths. And on a particular occasion, when all the rivers are flooding, the biggest flows they've had for decades, you get a concentration of nutrients, and uh, the phytoplankton turns into zooplankton, and the uh, manta rays come from everywhere. They know how do they know? We don't know how they know. They're not there normally, this that time of year. But real interesting. So this, this, um, this system here is the same system that I think was, causes Cranathorn starfish outbreaks here. The bottom of the slains is full of natural nutrient enrichment. Um, and that happens in other places in the world I've worked as well. Nothing to do with terrestrial runoff. Same effect though. Enrichment in phytoplankton, enrichment in big phytoplankton, the Cranathorn's larvae like to it. Now, I'm just going to quickly go through. There's lots of other stuff going on. Some by people from here, like, will come down. Microbial changes offshore in flood plumes. Some really nice work, but when you have nutrient rich water offshore from floods, the whole microbiology changes. And, you know, I mean, people think this is then we're off into more complicated things like coral disease. And so on, how does this affect microbiomes and things offshore? Lots of people interested in that. These are some Ames people mostly, um, people from here, um, originally from here, I guess, and Dave, um, Betty Wallace, and that's a really nice paper too that shows that when you have protective pillow zones, you have less disease. There's a whole lot of stuff about that. But that poor water quality can remove that protective effect of the closed zone um, associated with coral disease. Um, of course, poor sort of change water quality just kill the coral, like uh, in kettles, which sit right off the mouth of the Fitzroy River. It's amazing they're there at all, for reefs, pretty close to the river, big river. Why are they there? Because the Fitzroy River only flows once in every Recovery. They can recover. However, when we get um, more frequent floods out of the Fitzroy, then the corals in um, the capitals disappear, basically. Um, probably initially due to just low salinity, but other effects as well. And uh, Amelia published a nice paper also looking at how that the, the effects of the reserves interact with water quality and the poor water quality removes the effect of the reserves in a sense. Mm -hmm. We're also into pesticides. We won't even talk about pesticides, but here we are. We can measure pesticides offshore. They don't go too... Right, what about pesticides? Here you'll see they're close to the coast where we're measuring. Don't worry about all this. There's things like imidacloprid, the insecticide, very controversial insecticide, herbicides, atrazine, diorum, <coughs> tolachlor, tebuthorum from different industry uses. On the right offshore, um, but close to the coast, their concentrations are significant, if you like. What about out here? Well, amazingly, you can put a passive thing called a passive sample on a little membrane device, glued out for a week. It sucks up pesticides simplistically. You can put one out here, you can put one right up here. Now, today, when you're out for five days, you'll find pesticides. We have not found one place in the whole boat barrier reef, including Torres Strait and Hatboro, where we have not found pesticides. How come? They degrade away. There's a one nanogram per litre concentration. We're probably not doing anything. Maybe. But anyway, why? And that is because we now know from work done by Phil Mercurio and Andrew Negri and Ames, half lives of these pesticides, which used to think was about 50 days, were in the environment, 500. They don't go away quickly at all, and hence they can get everywhere. So we've polluted the whole Great Barrier Reef out into the Coral Sea and the Torres Strait with pesticides. A whole handful of them, too, not one. What's the long term impact of that? I hope nothing. <laughs> but not nice at um, So, what am I going to say in conclusion? Well, the impact area, it's complicated, lots of things going on, it depends on particular pollutants, sediment, pesticides, nutrients, and the species 
that we're looking at. Um, of course, it's um, sediment in particular is an effect closer to the coast. Nutrients can be further off shore, shore but particularly in this area in the wet tropics, in other places, the mid midshelf's too far offshore to be affected. Um, pesticides are very much close to the coast, the freshwater wetlands on the coast, mangroves. Um, and all these effects that entangle with climate change effects, and not separated anyway, whether it's coral disease, leaching response, even crater forms do different things when the water's warmer or the water's more acidic. And lots of people are studying those, those interactions between poor water quality and climate change, whether it's acidification, high temperatures, whatever. Um, I've got a little ad in here um, at the end. You're all fairly young, most of you, so a few old people. Um, how do I bother keep going? I'm 69. Well, with difficulty, it's <laughs> We've got a government in Canberra that's doing nothing. Queensland government's hard because they've got a majority um, and they're half, half sold on coal, other half on the back there. Um, and we have Mr. Trump in America, so that won't kill the Paris, but we'll put it back a few years. And you can be assured in the, water, in the climate change area, Australia's doing almost nothing. In the water quality area, we're doing too little, too often. So this is not a great story, but all I can encourage you to do is we're going to keep trying, I suppose. That's why I'm still here. Besides that I get paid as well to work now. <laughs> um, I work with a whole, you saw some of them there, thousands of people I work with. Um, you know, I'm just this, this uh, same message that I have to keep trying, but it's not, uh, not a good time. Not a good time for rest around the world if you're in Hawaii. Pretty horrific, and for the GBR either, but we can still hope, I guess. Okay, thank you.